So welcome to Watts Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is MEL3E, Grade 11 Workplace Math, and I am the teacher, Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call the Watts Studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or also on the television at Bell Express U channel 972. You are always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled Monday through Thursday from 9 till 10 in the morning, and we are in our fourth week of our nine week course. A reminder of what work to submit for marking, as you should be thinking about that. The support questions, the ones with the pencil icon, are not for marking. You decide which ones and how many to do. If you're understanding a concept, feel free to skip questions. You don't have to do them all just because they're there. That's totally fine for you to skip questions and pick and choose depending on what your need is. But if you need more practice, if you're struggling with a concept or something just doesn't make sense, let me know and I'm happy to send you more practice problems. The key questions, however, are the ones with the little key icon, and these are the mark questions, the ones that you need to submit. So please do all of these questions and show all of your work, your steps, and your thinking. This way I'm able to really understand what you understand, and if you're struggling with something, then I'm able to figure that out and help you with that idea. I can also give you part marks if you make a calculation error or something like that. So it's really important to show me all of your work. So how do you submit your work for marking? There are three methods. The first is to scan your work and send it electronically. So you can scan your completed work through a device, a tablet or a phone. Uh, Apple devices have a notes app, which has a scan function. And the Android devices have the Google Drive app, which is, has a scan function. Both are fairly straightforward to use and the apps are free. If you need support to figure out how to scan uh, with your device, let me know and I'm happy to walk you through it. The, if you need to take pictures because you don't have a device or uh, you aren't able to access these, then that is totally fine. The scanning just makes the files a little bit smaller and easier to send. But if you need to take pictures, that's fine too. Then you can send it to me through studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cch to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can also send it to me through Facebook Messenger at bslatewasa. The second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at our 74 Front Street location where the bright red building next to the post office and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. We are not yet open to the public hopefully soon. But for now, just put your work into that mailbox and I'll get it back to you as soon as I can. The third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. Students are also welcome to fax their work in if you have access to a fax machine, that's fine. So if you'd like to connect with me through social media, it's a really good place to find our, our materials and resources, and then also connect with me to get some support. My Facebook profile and YouTube channel are both under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can friend me on Facebook or accept my friend request and subscribe to me on YouTube. And then you'll get notifications every time I upload one of our lessons. All of our radio Zoom classes are recorded and a uploaded shortly after broadcasting. So it's a really good way to access the replays. So if you've missed a lesson or if you need to go over something again, then going to my YouTube channel, everything is there. All of our lessons are under a playlist MEL3E. And there's also short videos explaining common errors and confusing concept in case you need some support with something else. Uh, it's a really good place to go and check things out if you need some help. Math is a really visual subject, so I strongly encourage you to access the videos. Uh, join me live and just watch. You don't have to talk to me or ask questions, that's fine, but joining me live is one way to do it through Zoom uh, or accessing the replays on YouTube is really gonna set you up for the most success. So 
if you're unable to do either of those options because you don't have reliable internet or life just doesn't work that way, uh, let me know and I'm happy to send you a copy of the recordings so that you can still have the full experience and hopefully understand the, the concepts to the best of our abilities. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and contact me. My email address is bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca and my Facebook is bslatewasa. You can call me at the office at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. But if you need to contact me outside of those hours, uh, leave me a message or send me an email, and I'm happy to accommodate if we can figure out some time that works for both of us. All right, so we're doing lesson nine today, which is compound interest. Remember, we've talked about how lesson seven, eight, and nine are, are all connected. So this is the final of those three lessons. And we've been working from simple interest to compound interest and connecting the two. And so today we're going to be looking specifically at compound interest. So at the end of the lesson, you will understand the benefits of compound interest for investments and the drawbacks for loans. You'll be able to explain what principal, interest rate, time period, and compounds are in various situ situations. So you know you've met the learning goals because you can explain how compound interest earns more for investments but costs more for loans. And you can identify the principal, interest rate, compounding periods, and time in order to find the final amount. All right, so when will you use this in real life? So we're identifying the information we have and what we need to find. Problem solving in life, being able to figure out what information you know and what information you need to know is essential to be able to figure out problems. Uh, we, need, we don't necessarily always break it down like that, but that's really the, the foundation of solving problems in the world. And so this is the skill that we're really practicing in this lesson. But let's first activate our brain with some mental math. We know that I don't believe in mad math minutes, that they cause stress and anxiety in students and don't actually teach skills that are transferable that you can use in various situations. So we don't do that. Instead, we work on strategies and developing conceptual understanding so that we can have access to our facts, be comfortable with our math facts and numbers, but able to attack any problem because we have a a tool or a strategy opposed to just hoping that we memorized it. So our question today is 500 divided by 20. And we're going to use the concept of proportional reasoning. So the idea of proportional reasoning is that things that are proportional, so the things that have the same relationship can be, are going to be the same type of question. So we often do this without even realizing it. But so I'm going to say, okay, well, what is, and again, all of these questions, you can always do these in multiple ways. So we have 500 divided by 20. And so I can say, well, I know that both of these numbers are divisible by five. So that means that if I, 500 divided by 20 is the same relationship as 100 divided by four. Because 500 divided by five is 100 and 20 divided by five is four. So I know that I'm still talking about the same relationship. Even though I'm talking about smaller amounts, the relationship is still the same. So then the same thing as I can look and I can go, okay, well, this is 100 and 4 are both divisible by 2. So I'm going to divide them both by 2. I'm going to cut them both in half. So 50 divided by 2 is the same as 100 divided by 4, which is the same as 500 divided by 20. Well, then I can cut that in half again. So... 50 cut in half is 25, and two cut in half is one, and so that's going to equal 25. So 500 divided by 20 
is equal to 25 because all of these relationships are all the same. We didn't change our proportions. We're still comparing the same amounts to the same amounts. We're still saying if we have $500 uh, to 20 people is the same as $100 to four people, which is the same as $50 to two people, which is the same as $25 to one person, which is $25 per person. So $500 divided by 20 people is still gonna be $25 per person uh, is one way to think about it. If having a concept opposed to just numbers makes sense. So you can do this proportionally, you can compare these numbers so that you can make it to something that is easier for you to divide. All right, so what prior learning do we need to know for today? I just wanna go over what compound interest means because we talked about this previously, but we're gonna be diving into the intricate details today, but we just wanna remember what compound interest actually means. So compound interest is when we're earning interest on the principal and also the interest that we've already earned. So it's two parts for compound interest, both the principal and the previous interest. It has exponential growth, which is this uh, fast line where we go up and up and up fast and fast and fast. Uh, you can think of it as free money from free money if you're if this is an investment. Uh, so you're getting money, well, you're making money on the money that you already made, um, which is why it's kind of think of free money from free money. Uh, and it's really great for investments. That's how you get your investments uh, increase a lot and you make lots of money over a long period of time. But it's not helpful if you are borrowing money because the same idea is that if you owe money, then you end up paying interest on the interest that you already owe. So it's not great if you're borrowing money to have compound interest because then you owe money on the money that is that you didn't owe before. All right, so what is new today? So we're gonna talk about compounding frequency. So we're gonna go to, with an example and remember back with simple interest. So when we had, talking about simple interest, which is what we've been talking about for the last few days. So this is when you're only making interest on the original amount. So what happens when you have $1,000 and it's invested for seven years at 5% simple interest? So we make like a spreadsheet, we make a chart, we have our year, our principal, our interest on our amount. In year one, our principal amount is 1,000. So we make $50 on that $1,000, which means our final amount is 1,000 plus 50, which is $1,050. So in year two, our principal, remember we're still calculating interest on the 1,000, the original amount. We get another $50. So at the end of year two, we have $1,100. Or $1, and then that continues. Every year we make $50 and we add it to that amount so that we are able to see that we make $50 each year and that adds to our final amount. So after seven years, we have $1,350, which means we earned $350, okay? So now compare that to if we compound that yearly. So what happens when $1,000 invested for seven years at 5% interest compounded yearly? So you were, so again, we're gonna use our chart and we're gonna say, okay, all right, our first year, it's still the same. We're making $50 on that $1,000 principal and we end up with $1,050. But that means that at the beginning of year two, now we are investing $1,050. And so we're making more money. We're making $52.50. We earn an extra $2.50 because we get interest on that extra $50 that we didn't have before. And now we have $1,102.50. And then we continue that we remember that our principal changes every single year. So that at the end of seven years, we have a total of $1,000. $407.10, which means we made $407.10 with when we're compounding. 
So when we compare simple interest to compound interest, after seven years of simple interest, we had a total of $1,350, which means that we earned $350. And with compound interest, we had a total of $1,407.10, which means we earned $407.10 which means that we earned $57.10 more just because of compound interest, just because we were doing that where we were moving the principal, we were compounding it on the interest that we earned. So this is what we've talked about before. And it means that we are growing faster. So if we don't have any interest, if our interest is simple interest, we grow in this straight line. And after a long years, a lot of years, we can see when we compound, then that has a big, huge impact. We grow a lot more than with the simple interest. But what this is relating to today is that can we get even more money? Can we do this even more? So we know that compound interest earns more than simple interest, but the more frequently we compound, the faster the interest adds up. So not only can we, so what that means is that the more frequently we go back and we're investing that money, that we, interest that we've earned, we're gonna add, we're gonna get more and more interest. So here's a graph and these are all different compounding. So if we compound every year, like we've been doing so far, we have this growth here, we have this red line. So we start off in one year, we really don't see very much difference, but after 12 years, we're this red line. So one year, we compound once per year. That means that we just reinvest the interest that we've earned at the end of the year, we have this red line. But if we do it every month, that means at the end, the end of every month, we reinvest that money and we earn interest on the month on our bill we've already earned, we have this blue line. So you can see already at six years, we're starting seven years, we're starting to earn more and more and more. And after 12 years, we're much higher than we were if we just did it once per year. Then if we do it every week is this green line. So again, at the beginning, doesn't we can't tell the difference, but then you're gonna see that this green line is even a little bit higher than the blue line, which is months. And then if we did it in days, if we reinvest invested every day, after every day we earn interest, we can see this is this light yellow line. And so it goes up and up and up. You can see it's just a, even a little bit more. So the more often that we compound, the more frequently our compounding periods are, the faster the interest adds up. And so that's a really big difference because if the same idea is that if we invest that principal back with the interest, if we do it more often, we get, we're going to be earning interest on it more often. So compounding frequency. This is on page 29 of your IL booklet. This is what we've been just talking about. So the compounding period means the time frame in which compound interest is calculated. So compounding periods are often less than a year. You're, so that means that how often you're going to go back and invest that money or your money is going to be invested. You are not actually going to do anything. This is just all computers and banks and companies do all of this. You don't actually do anything. So our compounding frequency and the number, we need to look at what it's called and the number of compounding periods per year. So if it says that it's annually, that means that it's one compound period per year. We're just doing, we're compounding just once per year. If we do it semi-annually, that means we're doing it twice per year. If we're doing it quarterly, we're doing it four times per year. If we're doing it monthly, this is 12 times per year. If we're doing it semi-monthly, we're doing it twice a month, so this is 24 times a year. We're doing it weekly, this is 52 times per year. And if we're doing it bi-weekly, then we're doing it every two weeks, which is 26 times per year. And then if we're doing it daily, this is 365 days, 365 times per year. So these numbers, these words, and these numbers, are really important to remember because these words are gonna show up in your question and you're gonna need to know which numbers they mean. So highlight it, mark it, write it down, mark it on your page that page 29 
is super, super important because you need to know that what these words mean in terms of the numbers. Okay, so you don't have to memorize it. You might get used to it and be like, all right, that's what this number means. But it's super, super important to remember to connect these words to these numbers. So make sure that you look it up every time until you're feeling comfortable that you remember what it means. Okay, so we have, we're gonna use an actual formula. We've been using spreadsheets, we've been using charts, which is great to understand, but if you're doing something monthly for 25 years, that's gonna be a lot of charts to make. So we wanna understand what we're getting into without having to always do the char charts. So we have a formula that we can use. So our formula for compound interest, again, is on page 29, and is A equals P times, because that bracket means times, 1 plus I all to the exponent N. So that's what this formula means. And we're going to break it down to what the parts are. And then we're going to look at how we actually calculate it. So A, what we're finding is the final amount. How much money we have at the end of our investment. We're going to talk about this in general as investments. And then later we'll talk about it, how it relates to loans. So then P is your principal invested. So the amount of money that you start with is your P, your principal. We call this capital P is what we use in our formula. And then I is your interest rate. And this we need to have as a decimal and it's per compounding period. So this is where it gets to be slightly different than when we were doing your simple interest. So you need to do your interest rate as a decimal, which is what we've been doing before. But now you need to divide it by the number of compounding periods in one year. Because your how it works is that your interest rate is broken up into smaller chunks depending on how many times you're compounding it per the year for the year. So we're going to look at this more, but that's just what we're going to, where we're going. And then your N is the total number of compounding periods per year. So how we figured that out is that we have our number of compounding periods times our number of years. So again, this is a little bit different than simple interest. And so we need to remember, we're going to spend time on both these two ones that are a little bit more work to figure out our compounding formula. Again, you do not need to memorize this. That is the, uh, if you have the old booklet, that is the formula that is in your old booklet. If you have the new booklet this year, then also on page 29, um, we have the new formula because that can be a little bit confusing. So here our final amount and our principal are still the same. So it's still the final amount is the amount of money that you invest and the principal is the amount of money that you start with. But now instead of having it where you have one letter that means two things, I've now put in that you have the two letters. So you have your R, which is your interest rate and it's expressed as a decimal, just like usual. And then you have your N, which is your number of compounding periods. So your formula is A equals P all times one plus R divided by N all to the exponent N plus T. Sorry, N times T, my bad, sorry. So then your T is your number of years, your time in years. So again, we're gonna go through how this actually looks like in a question, cause it is kind of confusing. This is the super like math heavy, stereotypical, what this is what math is part of this course and it can be confusing, but so we're gonna walk through it. So as you can see, we're comparing these two formulas um, in case you see the A equals P times one plus I to the exponent N. Um, you might see that around, but we're gonna be using this one that looks a little bit more complicated, but makes your life easier. So A is always your final amount. P is always your principal invested. Then your R over N, R divided by N is your interest rate and your number of compounding periods, whereas your I in the second one is an interest rate as a decimal. 
divided by the number of compounding periods, you can see that it's exactly the same thing, just written in, in a little bit, written more explicitly in the formula we're going to use. And then the number of compounding periods, the NT in the first one is the same as N in the second one, because we just are breaking it apart. Um, again, you do not need to know how these two compare. It's just that if you see them, they are exactly the same thing. OK, so let's understand principle. This is on page 30 of your IL booklet. And remember, we're using the formula A equals P times 1 plus R divided by N all to the exponent N T. It's really, really important that you do what is inside the brackets first. And then what's inside the brackets, then you do it to your exponent. So if you remember BEDMAs, if you remember order of operations, it's really, really important that you follow the steps for your order of operations when you're using, uh, when you're doing any formula, but particularly this one in this course. So understanding principle, remember principle is the money that's invested or how much you borrow. So we're gonna look at these two questions to figure out if we can figure out what the principle is. So example one, Parker has $10,000 in a savings account at CIBC, earning 2.5% interest per year, compounded monthly. If he leaves his money in this account at, for five years, how much money will he be in the account at the end of five years? So these questions have a lot going on. So it's super important at the beginning to figure out what it is that you are being asked. So first we're going to figure out what P is, that's what we're trying to figure out. Principle, what is our principle? How much does Parker have? How much is he investing? $10,000. That is what Parker's investing. That's what P is equal to. That's all that I'm asking right now. So example two, Ashley borrows $25,000 at a rate of 8% per year compounded quarterly. If she doesn't pay back the loan for 15 years, how much money will she owe at the end of the term? So here, when we're talking about a loan, we're still talking about the principal, how much we're starting at the beginning with, and Ashley borrows $25,000. So that is our principal, that's what we're starting with. That's all that right now I'm asking you to figure out. It's really important to, in your questions to go through and pick out these different variables so that we can then use the formula at the end. Okay, so that's question 30. Sorry, page 30, question one, that is all you need to do. You just need to practice figuring out what the principle is. Okay, so now understanding interest rate. So this is the R and the T, sorry, the R and the N part of your formula. So remember it has two parts. Our interest rate has two parts. It has the interest rate given by the bank and the number of compounding periods in one year. So the interest rate is the percentage of the principal that the bank is giving you, you in investments or charging you if you have a loan. The compounding period or the frequency is how often the interest is added to the principal. So for our example, so Parker has $10,000 in a savings account at CIBC earning 2.5% interest per compounded, sorry, per year compounded monthly. So our R is our interest rate. So our rate is 2.5%. Remember this always needs to be in a decimal. So I'm gonna divide that by 100. 2.5 divided by 100 is gonna be 0 0.025. So we need to always change it into a decimal. Then our N, our number of compounding period, periods per year. So compounded, sorry, so interest rate, is that part, then your compounded, your N, compounded monthly, is where it tells us our N. And this is when we have to go back to that chart on page 29, that tells us monthly, tells us that it's gonna be every month. So our N is monthly. So that means it's 12. Every month is 12, monthly is 12. So for example two, Ashley borrows $25,000 at a rate of 8% per year, compounded quarterly. So our 8% is our rate. So R equals 8%, which is equal to 8% divided by 100, which is 0 0.08. 
and then our N is our compounded. So we're going to look for that compounded word, compounded quarterly. Quarterly means four times a year. So quarterly, so our N is equal to four. So that's how we figure out those parts of the question. So now on page 31, you can do question number two. That's all you need to do for question number two. All right, now understanding time. So this is on page 32. So this is the part that's in the exponent, the nt, where nt is n times t. So it also has two parts. It has the total number of time in years, and it has the number of compounding periods in one year. Both of these ends are the same. That's why we're using n, because they are the same. In math, if we have the same letter in the formula, we are talking about the same thing. That's they're both representing the number of compounding periods in one year. Our interest rate needs to be divided by that number and our time needs to be multiplied by that number. So this N is the same thing. You should be using that number twice. So this represents the total number of times the investment or loan is compounded in total. I say it twice because it's important, the total amount. T must be in years, just like in simple interest, T must be in years. So you may need to convert it based on months, weeks, or days. So that could be a little bit different. Often we're talking about years, but you might need to be paying attention and it has to be in years. So let's look at our examples. Parker has $10,000 in a savings account at CIBC earning 2.5% interest per year compounded monthly. That does not, and none of that tells us how long it's gonna be. If he leaves his money in this account for five years, how much money will be in the account at the end of five years? So our T, our total time in years is five years. It's already in years, so it's five. But we still need to know our N, right? Our N is based on our compounded monthly. So our N is 12 because it's 12 times per year. So then example two, Ashley borrows $25,000 at a rate of 8% per year, compounded quarterly. If she doesn't pay the back the loan for 15 years, how much money will she owe at the end of the term? So it's 15 years. So our time is 15 years, but our N is compounded quarterly. So our N is still four because we're compounding for quarterly or N is the same as before. When you are writing it all out, you don't need to write N twice, but here when we're breaking it apart, we need to have room to remember the N affects both the interest rate and the time. So now on page 33, you can do question number three, where you look at time. So now that's great. We picked it all apart, but now we need to put it all together. This is how we actually are doing our problems we, because our problems are have all the parts. So now let's look at one question with all the parts. Question number one, an amount of $4,000 is deposited into a savings account at the rate of 7% compounded monthly. Calculate the total balance after five years. So for these questions, we are figuring out what we know and what we don't know. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna list all of our variables. So the question asks us to calculate the total balance after five years so that we're looking for A, how much our final amount is or our total balance, our total amount is A. So that's what we're trying to figure out. We don't know that a number. So our P is equal to 4,000 because that's our principal. That's how much is deposited. Our R is equal to 7%, which is 0 0.07 because that's the rate that's given to us. Our N is compounded monthly, so 12. And our T is five because we have five years. So you need to go through your question like I've done and write down all of your variables so that you know what you're going to be using. This is super helpful. If you do this, then this tells me that you understand part of this question. If you make a mistake when you're doing the calculation, okay. But if you write this down, then this is telling me that you understand where these numbers are coming from and what the numbers are supposed to be. So I can give you a bunch of marks for that. Then you're gonna put it into your formula. So you have A equals P, times, which you're going to open up a bracket, 
one plus r divided by n, you're going to close your bracket, and then that's to the exponent n times t. So I suggest that you always write down your formula so you know where your numbers go. And then all you're going to do is you're going to take the numbers that you've written down, your variables written down, and you're going to replace your variables with those numbers. So for this question, a equals 4,000 times 1 plus 0 0.07 divided by 12, close your bracket, all to the exponent 12 times 5. You're going to write all that in so I can see that you know where the numbers go. Then you can do this in a couple of ways. You can just do this whole calculation all in one step on a calculator. That is fine and get your final answer. That's OK. That's how I generally do it, but you, so you can do that. If you want to do it in parts and you want to write down, you want to do inside your brackets first, and then you want to write that down, then if it has more than five decimal places, then it is best to keep your, that number in your calculator to get the most accurate calculation. If you're going to write it around it, how you have to have at least five decimal places. Don't round it to two. You need at least five decimal places to help you. This is why I encourage you to not do that, but just leave the calculation all in your calculator. But if you want to, you can. It's Then you finally get A equals $5,670.50. Your final amount after five years in the savings account is going to be $5,670.50. And that's how you calculate compound interest using the formula. So. As we've talked about it, compounding is great for investments because we get money based on the money that we've already made, free money on free money, but it also applies to loans and debts. So let's look at that. Xavier's credit card balance is $800 at the beginning of July with an interest rate of 19.99% compounded daily. He forgot to pay his bill until the next month. How much interest did he have to pay? So we're assuming that he hasn't bought anything else all we're assuming is that he had his, he had that balance of $800 on his credit card for the month of July. So first we're trying to find the interest. That's all we're asking. So you need to recommend, remember that the question is asking how much interest did he have to pay? So for the amount, for compound interest, the amount is equal to principal plus interest, right? So that's what we're looking for. So that's so this is gonna be a little bit different, but all, with compound interest, we still need to use that one formula that we have. So our principal is $800. That's how much he borrowed. The rate is 19.99%, which is divided by 100 is 0 0.1999. The compounding period N is equal to 365 because it's compounded daily. And this is actually how credit cards work. And the time is for July. So that's th 31 days in July divided by 365. Because remember, this is per year. So our time is 31 divided by 365, which you can do in a decimal, but I encourage you to leave it as a fraction because it makes your life simpler, really. So for our calculation, remember, we have A equals P times 1 plus R divided by N, all to the exponent N. So we put in our numbers. So A is equal to 8,000, sorry, 800 times 1 plus 0 0.1999 divided by 365. Close your bracket to the exponent, 365 times 31 divided by 365. So that's going to simplify to A equals 800 times 1.00054 to the exponent 31, which is equal to a equals $813.69. So have we answered the question? No, because that is our final amount, right? A is our final amount. It includes the principal as well as the interest. So we want to just figure out what the interest is. So we have to remember that A is equal to principal plus interest. So our interest is equal to our final amount, take away our principal. So our interest is equal to eight. $113.69, take away 800, that's how much principal we had, which is equal to $13.39. So Xavier has to pay $13.39 in interest for his credit card balance that he carried in July. And that's how you can figure it out for loans. 
if you're trying or if you're figuring out how much interest you want to that you earn that's also how you figure out just the interest in general so now you can do the support questions on page 35 question number four so let's do a few more examples before we run out of time uh, this is hard this is confusing so we need to break it all down practice 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 ask me questions but you need to practice this one is hard so example number three Chris wants to invest $1,000 at 4.25% compounded quarterly. How much bigger will their investment be after 20 years opposed to after 10 years? So we're asking about us in two times, which often these questions are, they're comparing two things. So we're gonna to need to do this twice. So I'm gonna draw a line down the middle of my screen in order to have these two different situations. So in situation one, our principal, wait, first, what are we, what are we asking? How much bigger will their investment be? So how much bigger? That's telling me that we're looking for the final amount. That's what we're, we're gonna need to figure out is our final amount. So our principal is equal to $1,000. Our rate is equal to 4.25%. which is equal to 0 0.0425 as our decimal. Then our N, our compounding period is quarterly. So quarterly is four times a year. And our time, well, we're gonna do this as the 20 years. So our time is gonna be equal to 20. So our formula is A equals P times one plus R divided by N all to the exponent N T is equal to 1000 times one plus 0 0.0425 divided by four all to the exponent four times 20. Now I'm gonna put this into our Desmos calculator and I'm just gonna do it all at once. So 1000 times, you can either use the, click on the bracket or press shift and nine is to open a bracket. One plus 0 0.0425 divided by four. Now with Desmos, you need to make sure that you're looking at your cursor. So here right now it's flashing. If I do something else, it's gonna to happen to this four. So I need to move it outside of my bracket and close my bracket so that I know what, so that it's in the right place. So sometimes it doesn't, so here I did four times 20, but it told me it was like, okay, so we're, it thought that I wanted to times something by 20, which I don't. So I need to be making careful. I need to be paying attention to that. So I need to put my four times 20 into brackets so that it puts it where I want it actually to be. So that gives me $2,329 and 18 cents. So that's how much my investment would be after 20 years. So if we compare it to 10 years, we are still looking for A, our total amount. Our P is still $1,000. Our R is still 0 0.0425. Our N is still four and our T now is 10. So, even though I'm doing the same thing twice, I'd still write out what I'm doing because I'm comparing, I wanna know what I am comparing. So A equals 1000 times one plus 0 0.0425 divided by four all to the exponent four times 10. And then again, doing all my Desmos, So again, you can do this on your own calculator. You do not need to use Desmos, but with I really like Desmos because you can see everything that you've done, but you do what makes the most sense for you, what's easiest for you. So that's $1,526.17. 1526 17.
So have we answered the question? So the question is how much bigger will their investment be after 20 years opposed to after 10 years? No, we haven't actually answered the question. We need to figure out how much bigger. So we're gonna compare, we're gonna do 20 years, take away the 10 years, the amounts. So $2,329.18, take away $1,526.17. So we need to make sure that we are actually answering what the question is asking. Because yes, you found out a bunch of information, which is true information, but the question is asking us how much is it gonna be, how much bigger? So it's $803 and one cent bigger, 803.01. So Chris's investment. Is eight hundred and three dollars and one cent bigger after 20 years. So make sure you're answering the question. All right, so let's consolidate. That was a lot we did today. So again, this is a hard lesson. I know it's hard. It's going to take you some time to work on it. Please ask me questions. Go over this lesson again and review it and slow it down. Stop, take breaks. This is a hard lesson. So we learned that we remembered that compound interest grows exponentially and the pattern increases and decreases at a constant ratio. So that's just saying that we are going up or down by the same, by multiplying by the same amount. We don't have to know that too closely, but we're growing exponentially. Our formula is A equals P times one plus R divided by N all to the exponent NT, where A is our final amount in money, P is our principal amount in money, R is our interest rate as a decimal, T is our time in years, and N is our number of compounding periods. Also, if we're trying to find the interest, we need to do the amount, take away our principal to find our actual interest in dollars. So hopefully you are comfortable explaining how compound interest earns more for investments, but costs more for loans. And you can identify the principal, interest rate, compounding periods, and time in order to find your final amount. That's what our focus is, is being able to figure out what those pieces are in a problem and pull them out so that you can figure out what your final amount is. Again, take some time with this lesson. This is a lesson that people struggle with the most. It's pretty abstract. It's pretty math, like stereotypical math, calculation heavy. Take your time with it. Ask questions, do practice, reach out to me if you're struggling with it. It's understandably that it's, it's a bit tricky. So if you do have any questions, as I've just been saying over and over again, please reach out. I'm here. This is my job. My job is to support you. I will not judge you if this is hard. I understand this part. This part of this is probably the hardest part of this whole course. This lesson is what people really struggle with, um, but we can get you through it. I'm here to help you. I'm here to walk you through it. I'm here to support you. So please reach out. You can call me at the office at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or you can call toll-free at 1-800-667-3703. You can email me. My email address is bronwyn.slate, and that's spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can reach out to me through Facebook. Lots of people ask me questions. You can send me even if you're doing one problem, you can send me a picture of that one problem that you're doing and we can talk, walk, talk it through. Um, or we can even video chat through Facebook if that would be helpful for you. you do, we don't have to, but we can. So my name there is B Slate Wassa. Also, you can connect with me on YouTube and find the recording of this lesson and be able to go through it at your own pace. Uh, and that's also called B Slate Wassa and YouTube. So there's lots of different ways, whatever feels best for you. Um, if email feels best, then email me. If phone feels best, then call me. Do what works best for you. 
but really reach out and get the support if you need it. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. But again, if that doesn't work for you because you are working, you have a busy life, it's completely understandable. We can make it work if you, uh, either you can send me messages and then I can send them back to you for when I'm working. Um, that's sometimes how I work with students is that they send me messages when it's convenient for them and I send them messages when it's convenient for me and we work that way. Um, or we can also arrange a time that works for you if you want to actually speak with me directly. Reach out to me and we can make that happen. This Friday is uh, the in mem remembrance of the murdered children from residential schools. So it's orange shirt day. I really feel like maybe it's truth reconciliation day. We need a better day name for it other than orange shirt day, but we will be closed in honoring of remembering the indigenous children who were stolen from their families in, and many who did not return to their families from residential schools. So we will not be open on Friday, um, but we will be open on Thursday tomorrow and then back again next week. So you can reach out and connect with me uh, if you need some support. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely day. Which.